Hey, security researcher here once again. Thanks for checking out my video. Uh, today we're going to talk about stingrays. Um, I'm actually going to use the term cell phone tower simulator. Uh, it's a much safer term for me to use. Uh, we're going to discuss what these devices are, who uses them, how they function, how they're deployed, what they can do once they are deployed, how you yourself can determine if one is operating in your area, as well as what you can do to protect yourself from them. Now, this is going to be a long video. I'm re-recording the audio here for God knows how many times. Uh, I'm going to try to include as much information as I can here. I ask that you be patient and watch this thing all the way through. By the time you're done, hopefully not only do you know more about this stuff than just about anybody you know, but you're pissed and you're willing to start to talk to others about this because this is a problem. Um, that all being said, the information that I provide in these videos is not intended for the criminally minded. This really truly is about education. You cannot make informed decisions about things as complicated as technology if you don't have even the most basic understanding of what it is that you're talking about. So let me take 20 years of research experience, boil it down into plain English so that we can all better understand the risks that we face on a daily basis. Now, let's get into this topic. Again, cell phone tower simulators, and the first point is what they are. Now, I suppose the first thing that we need to do here is give you a visual reference of what it is that we're talking about. Some of this equipment is designed to be installed in a vehicle like a surveillance van or an SUV of some type. Maybe it's an airplane or a drone. Um, a lot of this stuff can be located in fixed positions, so a building with an antenna nearby. Um, basically what the equipment needs is access to power, access to some sort of data, whether it's a high-speed data connection uh, like the one that you have coming into your house or the ability to communicate wirelessly uh, with some sort of a data connection. Um, but those things are required for it to function um, depending on how it's operating. Uh, it also needs uh, some sort of a terminal, like a laptop computer, um, and whatever associated software to translate the data that the equipment is bringing in. Um, that said, there's also smaller devices. So when the media refers to it as one specific device that's big and bulky, what they're concealing through obfuscation uh, is things like this device that fits in a backpack. Or this device that's handheld, so you could walk into um, maybe a tea party gathering or uh, some sort of a, a labor protest or whatever and, you know, gather information about the devices that are present. Or this device right here that allows the attacker to attack up to 60,000 phones at one time. Not exactly targeted surveillance in my mind. And when you keep in mind the fact that these can be located in fixed positions, you could sprinkle these around a community and monitor every single phone in town. Uh, we'll cover all of the things that are at least publicly known about this technology because I'm really not interested in spending a lot of time here or meeting people like these guys. So I'm going to try to only discuss what is publicly known um, and put it into context so that we can all understand the threat. So now that you know what the things look like, let's talk about what they actually are and how they function. So what is a cell phone tower simulator? Just as the name implies, it functions like a legitimate cell phone tower. Uh, it communicates back and forth with your device on its normal communication channels. So as far as your device is concerned, it's on a legit cell phone tower. Uh, it works on all of these smart and dumb phones that are out in the market today and no, I don't care how super cool or secure you think your phone is. Uh, it is susceptible to attack by these types of devices. Um, I know that everyone likes to talk about the legal restrictions of the use of cell phone tower simulators. Uh, warrants, writs, court orders, trap and trace, pen registers, etc. But this technology is designed to work without having to attain legal authorization. It can be deployed without anyone knowing that it's being used. There's no paper trail that the system is being deployed, so there's no audit that can occur to find out whether it was used. 
You have to realize that before they used to have to go through the cellular service providers to gather information, but it was really messy and it left paper trails everywhere. With the release of this technology all the way down to your local community, now they don't have to worry about that. Now, this would be a concern to you and I if we had a system that was displaying a disdain for traditional legal limitations on power and authority. If we had organizations and agencies and individuals operating in secret, hiding behind non-disclosure agreements, lying to Congress, or just general corruption running rampant throughout the system. But since we know we don't have that happening here in the United States, we know that we don't have anything to worry about, right? That is until you realize that it's already been proven that for as little as $1,200 or less, just about anybody can build a device that has similar capabilities to this technology. The fact that backdoors exist in any of our technology means that not only can the quote-unquote good guys use it, but anybody who's aware that those backdoors exist can also use them. We are all operating under a very flawed trust model when it comes to technology. We are putting our faith and trust in corporations and technology where it should never have been placed to begin with, and it's been going on for so long that we've become apathetic to the risks, and it's really time to stop that. So let's go on and talk more about this technology, and I'll get off my soapbox. So let's talk about how these devices function. What's happening here is what the InfoSec community calls a man-in-the-middle attack. Just as the name implies, the attacker slips within range of your device and the network node that it's trying to communicate with, in this case a cell phone tower, and depending on its mode of operation, can interact with the data that's being sent to and from your device. It could be listening, it could be acting as a relay, uh, and capturing all the information that's supposedly being sent directly to the cellular network. Um, you have to keep in mind that your phones are slaves to the tower. So anytime your device is connected to any cell phone tower, whether it's legitimate or simulated, the tower dictates to the phone what's going to happen during that communication session, including shutting off session encryption. So now how are these devices deployed? So if you have an attacker that has a cell phone tower simulator, how is it that they can set this thing up so that your device will connect to it? Well, as we covered in Cell Phone Tracking Explained in Plain English Part 1, your phone checks in with the cell phone network towers on a regular basis. This is somewhere around every 3 to 7 seconds. Uh, your phone is always trying to connect to numerous towers at the same time to ensure you quality of service. When a phone initially connects to a tower for the first time, it gathers information about the surrounding network. Things like what carriers are operating towers in the network, what channels your phone can use to communicate with the antennas on those towers. Uh, this information is ter temporarily stored on your phone, so if your device moves, loses signal, etc., it can quickly switch channels in order to maintain connectivity. Uh, it's also why when you travel, your phone may tell you that instead of using, say, AT&T, your phone is connected to Metro PCS. It all goes back to uh, billing for roaming and things like that. So while this information has its legitimate uses, this information is also useful to an attacker who comes into an area and wants to configure their cell phone tower simulator to work more efficiently. Uh, they can query the towers themselves and get information about what cell phone towers are in the area, what frequencies or channels the antennas on those towers are operating on, uh, what carriers your phone might be expecting to see in the area, uh, and then using that information, they can configure their simulated cell phone tower. Now, since the phones are really slaved to the tower, uh, the towers send the phones all of the commands as related to their operations. So if you were running a simulated cell phone tower, you could tell the phone that you're the strongest cell phone tower in the area in order to trick it to uh, get it to attempt to connect to your device. Uh, you can also uh, shut off session encryption so that what would normally be protecting, uh, either shut it off or downgrade it to make it easier to crack. So what would normally protect the confidentiality of your communications is basically negated. So first we need to understand that these devices operate in one of two modes. One is a passive mode. And the best way I can describe passive to you 
is it's like the radio in your car. You can tune into different frequencies or channels and you can hear information, but you can't interact with that information. All you can do is listen to it. Uh, when it comes to cellular technology or maybe encrypted information, you can listen to it, record it, and then de-encrypt it, um, but you're never really uh, transmitting. So you're not giving away the fact that you're there. The other mode that these things operate in is, a, is an active mode. And an active mode is where the device is now acting as a relay. So instead of your traffic going directly to the cellular tower or being broadcast to the cellular tower where they could listen, they've now tricked your phone to directly connecting to them and they're receiving all the information coming directly from your phone and then passing it on to either a wireless network or a directly connected high-speed internet network so that everything that's coming off of your phone passes through their device and they can capture and filter all of the information that's coming off of it. Now, what is that information? And what are the commands that they can send back to your phone when they're in active mode? What does that allow them to do? Okay, well, without putting these in any specific order, some of the information that can be captured on your device is something called an IMEI number. IMEI stands for International Mobile Station Equipment Identity. It's also known as the MEID or Mobile Equipment Identifier. Now, this is the unique serial number of your specific phone, and using it, the person that's doing the attack can determine the make, model, and product variant. So maybe it's a Samsung Galaxy S6, or an iPhone 6, or an HTC One M9, whatever. But you can also determine the product variant, which tells them things like the device firmware that may be operating because of the chips that are installed on that specific phone. Um, it's very specific down to your exact device. That's your phone's unique identifier on the network. You yourself can find this number. It's either going to be on a white sticker under the battery, or you can find it by bringing up your phone's keypad and hitting star pound zero six pound or in modern vernacular, star hashtag zero six hashtag. Um, but yeah, star pound zero six pound will bring up your phone's unique serial number. Now, something to keep in mind here is if you're a special person, maybe you work for an agency or a department and you have a special phone that you think is secure, if it has a unique IMEI number that identifies it as a unique piece of hardware, that can actually help an attacker determine whether or not your device is worth looking at. So some of the same techniques and tools that you use to determine whether certain people are worth looking at can also be turned around and used on you. Uh, this technology is a dual-edged sword, so you need to keep that in mind. So another piece of information that can be gathered is something called an IMSI, or MC. Uh, it's where the term MC catcher comes from. IMSI is International Mobile Subscriber Identity. This number is encoded on your cell phone's SIM card or on the phone itself if it doesn't have a SIM card. The number is directly associated with the person who's paying for the service. So not only can it be used to track it back to whoever's paying the bill, it can also be used to associate to the person who uses that SIM card for making phone calls. So even if you're switching phones on a regular basis, maybe you think you're James Bond and that's going to like somehow protect you. That SIM card has a unique identifier that's associated with whoever is paying the bill. And if somebody's monitoring that SIM card, that MC number, they can associate your voice with that MC and then it doesn't matter who's paying the bill. As far as they're concerned, that MC is you. When one of these cell phone tower simulators is in passive mode, again, listening like your car radio, any information that's transmitted to or from your phone can be captured and monitored. That includes live calls. That includes text messages as you send them. That includes emails, any data traffic, anything that you're doing. Even if you're using one of these applications that's super cool and it encrypts my voice traffic and sends it over the wireless and blah, 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 you're still transmitting it. And anybody that can tune in to pick up that transmission can capture that transmission. And even if it is encrypted, they now have the data and can de-encrypt it themselves. So again, we're operating under a terribly flawed trust model when it comes to technology. And I really don't care how smart you think you are. You're operating under a flawed trust model, believe me. 
So that's just it in a passive mode. It really gets interesting when these devices operate in an active mode because now they can interact directly with your phone. They can mess with power management. So you may think your phone shuts off, the screen does what it normally does, and it makes the no noises that it normally does when it shuts off, but the phone isn't really off. So the microphone can still be used to eavesdrop on what's going on in the room. The camera can still be activated. The GPS can still be tracked. You have to realize that, you know, anything that's stored on the device at this point, because this device has connected onto your phone, so your banking history, your passwords, your call logs, your phone book, all of which can be used to create additional target lists, all of this stuff is available whenever one of these devices in an active mode connects up to your cell phone. Something else that's important to pay attention to is, you know, I had mentioned that your camera can be activated. And a lot of people will automatically think, well, whatever, my phone's in my pocket. Well, where's your phone when you're reading a text? And where's the camera when you're looking at the screen on your phone? You've got a camera that's pointed at you, so I can identify that you're reading that text. But where's the camera on the back of your phone pointed? You know, these things can be used for video surveillance. They can be used for audio surveillance, even in your own home, even in your business. Now, even if your colleagues, your friends, and your family members don't take this stuff seriously, it's up to you to do it. You have to educate them, and they need to understand it. You're going to get a lot of flack. You're going to be told you're crazy and you're paranoid. But the fact of the matter is, is this stuff is happening. I just want to take a second to point out something here. We're only talking about cell phones in this video. But you need to think about all the other devices that you own that operate wirelessly. If they transmit and receive information, they are, can be subject to a man-in-the-middle attack. So we're not just talking about your cell phone, your tablet, uh, your laptop, maybe your PC if you've connected it wirelessly, but also the wireless router itself. All of these devices can be attacked remotely through a man-in-the-middle attack. So it's important that you realize we are operating under a terribly flawed trust model when it comes to technology. Now let's get back on topic and talk about man in the middle attacks using cell phone tower simulators against your cell phone. What are some of the symptoms that this could be occurring against your device? So when it comes to symptoms, it's important that I state here that this technology is always evolving. So some of the symptoms that I'm gonna say now might not be symptoms next week when the new version comes out. Um, these are just some of the things that I know of. I'm probably gonna miss a few of them, uh, but here's a list anyway. Uh, your phone gets warm. You're not even on it and you pick it up and it's warm, which means it's been transmitting and receiving. Uh, the battery drains quicker than usual. Uh, you have no or seriously degraded data service when there should be decent data service. Um, you have no or seriously degraded voice service. Maybe there's a lot of people around and they're routing all of the traffic through one of these cell phone tower simulators. So there isn't as much bandwidth to go around and the voice service now sucks. Um, this one's usually a dead giveaway, but I absolutely do not recommend that you try it. It is illegal. Uh, don't do this unless of course it's a genuine emergency but if you try to dial 911 and you do not have 911 service again don't do this but that's a dead giveaway that your device is connected to a cell phone tower simulator um, your friends might get a text message from you but when that text message comes up on their phone, it doesn't come up with your phone number. It comes up with something odd, like some sort of a four-digit combination of numbers, but not your actual phone number. Okay, so you've made it this far, and you're interested in figuring out what the solution to all of this is. If you cheated and fast-forwarded and got here, shame on you. Go back and listen to the whole thing. You're not as smart as you think you are, and there's stuff that you need to know. So if you got here organically, thank you for listening to the whole thing, and let's talk about solutions. The technology is constantly evolving. It's kind of like the weapons and armor thing. That is, the weapons improve, the armor improves, and as the armor improves, the weapons improve. It's just that we're talking about cyber weapons. So what is the armor that we can use against these cyber weapons? How can we protect ourselves? And the solution, at least as I see it, is really twofold. Um, one is signal isolation, um, which means encapsulating your phone in a way that you can prevent 
all of the signals that your phone can interact with from getting to or from your phone. Uh, if your phone can receive any signals whatsoever, it can be used to compromise uh, the integrity of the device. The microphone, all the things that we've discussed can all be accessed if your phone can send and receive signals. So you have to find a way to isolate it so that it can't send and receive signals. But that causes a problem in your connectivity because now since the phone can't send and receive signals, you're essentially isolated. I have a solution for that as well. So let's take this in two parts. Let's talk about the isolation options that are out in the market, and let's talk about the connectivity option. So let's start with the do-it-yourself solutions. And the do-it-yourself crowd is really adamant that they have the solution. I have a question for you, if you believe that you have the solution. Have you paid to have a lab test your solution? And keep in mind that the solution that you send to the lab is going to be different than the next one you make because you're just slapping these things together. So the reason that I say have you had it tested is, you know, we're all familiar with, you know, gases, air in a car tire, uh, liquids, water in a bucket. I can hear the air leaking out of my car tire. I know that it's leaking. I can see moisture on the outside of my bucket and wipe it off and it comes back. So I know that my bucket's leaking. I can't hear the RF leaking out of my enclosure. I can't wipe it off and see it reappear again on the outside of my do-it-yourself enclosure. I have no idea what frequencies are penetrating my enclosure. I have no idea. Um, I don't know how effective it is until I have it tested because uh, nobody, unless you have about 150 grand worth of equipment, can tell you what frequencies are leaking out of your do-it-yourself enclosure. And the enclosure that you make is going to be different than the enclosure that the next guy makes, even if they're using the same overall premise. So there's just too many variables in the do-it-yourself community for me to endorse any do-it-yourself solution. And that brings us to the commercial products that are out in the market. And there's really two families of products, soft cases and hard cases. The soft cases that are out in the market were analyzed by Purdue University's Cyber Forensics Lab, and they found that of the ones that they tested, they had an overall failure rate of about 53%. So more than half the time in a normal network operating environment, they failed. When you bring a cell tower simulator in and you get the antenna even closer and you up the power output, they're going to fail even more frequently than 53%. Soft cases are not reliable products. Um, I, another thing to note about soft cases is I don't know of any of the soft cases that are out on the market that have paid to have an independent nationally recognized lab certify that their product works. What I typically see is shielding effectiveness based on the materials that they're then sewing together to make their product. The shielding effectiveness of a material is totally different than the shielding effectiveness of the product that you then make out of that material. So there's that too. Now that leaves you with signal blocking hard cases that are rigid in construction. So I only know of one out there that's manufacturing a hard case that actually works. Um, and they do have uh, independent lab verification of the effectiveness of their product. I'm not gonna endorse anybody's products today. That's not what I'm here for. This is about information. But if you're looking for a signal blocking product, you're ultimately looking for something with laboratory verification that proves the highest level of signal attenuation possible. This is measured in something called DB or decibels of signal attenuation. And you want that number as high as possible no matter what solution you're looking for. I would look at the signal blocking hard case that's out on the market and I would stay away from the fabric. Now you've blocked signals so you can't receive phone calls and text messages on your phone now what do you do to maintain connectivity? Well, this is going to sound a little odd because it's a little retro. But if you get yourself a one-way alphanumeric pager, you can not only receive numeric messages, but you can also get text messages and emails. It is an unencrypted connection, but most of the messages that you're going to get, honey, pick up a gallon of milk on your way home, Mr. Smith, your paperwork's ready, swing by my office to pick it up. Those messages don't need to be encrypted. So 
you don't really have to worry about that aspect of it. The big benefit that you get is you get connectivity without all the strings attached. You don't have a microphone that can eavesdrop on your conversations. You don't have cameras that can see what you're doing. You don't have GPS tracking. The devices only listen. They don't broadcast. So you can't be location tracked. You can regain some of your privacy while still maintaining connectivity. And that's really what it's all about. I didn't create this problem. I'm just trying to provide you with a navigation around it. So get yourself a signal blocking product that works and get yourself a one-way alphanumeric pager. Modify the outgoing message on your voicemail. So at the end of it, you say, if this matter is really urgent, please send me a page or a text or whatever at this, you know, insert number here. And there you go. You've blocked third-party intrusion into your cell phone. You've maintained connectivity with the outside world. And is it perfect? No, but again, I didn't create the problem. I'm just trying to give you one path around it. If you found value in this information, please hit the subscribe button. Share this video with your friends and family. Stay tuned because there is more fun to come. I am Security Researcher, and if you just gave me the last 26 minutes of your life, I want you to know that I really appreciate it. Thank <laughs> you.